Hi, everybody. Welcome to this edition of Thinking Out Loud. And uh, today we have Katrina Fencook with us as my co host. Hi, Katrina. Hello. And Misty Lynn is our special guest tonight. Hi, Misty. Hi, Arizona. Um, and Katrina is now going to be our permanent co host for at least the next three months. Mm -hmm. Uh, she has replaced Rain, who is off doing bigger and better things. I, <laughs> she is involved in so many projects. It just amazed me that she could co-host for as long as she did. And we are deeply appreciative of the effort she gave us. So, um, Misty, since we're going to talk about a what most people would consider an icky, one of probably the ickiest subject next to Texas, <laughs> um, would you like to start us off with a breathing exercise so we're all nice and calm and relaxed? You're muted. Uh, I would love. To, yeah, yeah, I'd love to do so. Um, uh, my little dog has decided that to, now he's starting to yap up, so um, he, he may interrupt the exercise, but we'll hope he doesn't. Okay. Um, what I'd like to teach you is from the Institute of Heart Math, and, and I love the Institute of Heart Math because they're doing some great work around uh, showing us that, that there is a brain in the heart mm. and that how we feel, like the electromagnetic field of the heart, is that is actually quite large. So when we're, I think the last I read was in five or ten feet of someone, they can pick up and sense how we're feeling. And and I use this information when um, helping people who are um, aiding a loved one who's who's passing on, and then just teach them to be heart centered. Mm. Um, one of the great things um, that heart math teaches, it's called heart coherence. And what I'm going to teach you right now is the quick coherence technique. And this just brings you into that heart-centered, peaceful place. And if we were to, um, if you've seen the heart charts, you know the da -dum, da -dum. So when you're in coherence, the, the charts, they have nice rhythm to it. And when you're out of coherence, and that's like feeling anger or frustrated or, or some of the more <laughs> negative feelings, um, then that like I might have just had a little blurt when my dog barked <laughs> with the coherence, but uh, um, then you're out of coherence. So it, it's always better if we can operate from a place of coherence. So let's uh, I'll teach you this technique. So we'll start by just bringing our attention and our focus on our heart and it might help if you put your hands on your heart and breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth we'll take some deep belly breaths like your your guest Lorraine Gordon shared last week so breathing in connecting with breath and we're going to bring our focus to your heart so bring your attention to the area of your heart and some people even like to imagine a nose on their heart. This kind of cracks me up a bit, but as if they're actually breathing, <laughs> breathing through their heart. Really bringing the area of attention there. And then what we're going to do is, is think of something that's pleasing to you. Think of a memory or a place in your imagination or a, a loved one. Uh, something that makes you happy. And breathe into that. And that, that is the quick coherence technique. And it, it can be done in as little as three breaths, or it, it may take uh, up to ten breaths, as long as you want. But when you focus on your heart, and remember that special thing that makes you feel happy that brings your whole body, mind, and breath into alignment with this peaceful feeling and that creates heart coherence. So. That is beautiful. Yeah, she has such a calming voice too. She does. <laughs> it's very grounding. 
but it's also very upbeat as well, I find. Thank you. That's actually, um, well, it's, it's not a surprise to me now, but a while back I asked some of my, my close buddies, and they'd, they'd only known me on, on Skype, so they really only knew my voice, and I said, what's my best quality? What's my area of genius? And it surprised the heck out of me when they said your voice. So, yeah, so, so thank you for reaffirming that. Sure. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to start today with, um, you, you know, I, I know you've watched it, we had a really active conversation there for a while going on right after I posted up the show. Mm -hmm. um, and Blair um, posted this that I wanted to share. Uh, Misty Lynn is correct, we were babies when it comes to death and discussing it. I came to terms with death around 2006 and have tried to assist my children in coming to terms with my ultimate de demise. However, they are close to discussing it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to learning more techniques to assist me in this area. And, and I think that that is a serious issue and I, th I think that's why I named it about, around, and through. Because, you know, um, my parents didn't even want to discuss the possibilities of, you know, for a long time and my dad opened up to it first. My mom never, never wanted to discuss death, period. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you prepare, how do you, how do you discuss this with your children or, you know, other loved ones around you so that you are prepared? Yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I think the, the biggest part is that we're grow, we grow up in a culture where it's not normal. Like it's almost like talking to your children about sex. It's, it, you know, it's, it's very similar to that. It's like, ah, no, no, we don't want to go there. Um, so I think a big part of it is just normalizing it. And I think the only way we can begin to normalize it is through talking about it. And... And and then you know again, but you will you will come up with the resistance. So one of the best ways that I've learned to break through resistance is through laughter and joking, because which which you wouldn't normally ever pair with death, <laughs> but when someone's laughing, their brain relaxes and and when the brain's relaxed, that's when it's most receptive to new learning. So if you can bring people to a point of finding some kind of humor around this topic, um, that would be your in. That, that would be your in. And then the challenge, of course, is, is how to do that. Well, do you have any suggestions on how to bring humor? Uh-oh, we lost her. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Oh, no, really? Oh, no. <laughs> we lost her. Uh, well, we'll just have to wait for her, give her a minute to come back. But, you know, she it, she brings up a really good point because it is pretty challenging to laugh in those times. But if you think about what a buildup of energy that you have, re laughing is such a great release for that. It would be such a, 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 a nice way to sort of remember the person and what made you laugh about them and at the same time sort of release some of that pent-up emotion. You know, it's. I, I think a lot of people, when they have that much emotion built up, it's really hard to discern between what they're actually feeling. They're all kind of mushed together. Oh yeah, I I totally agree with that. I mean, my, I went through three losses last year, like in three months. It was crazy, um, and my emotions were just up and down and up and down and up and down during that whole period. Well, especially when there's, I mean, even when they're expected or not expected, you know, it, it, people feel that one way or the other is better. It's, it's still a loss in your life. There's still someone that was there that isn't there anymore, and that takes some adjustment. And then to have that many people in a row, it's, that's got to be a lot to manage. It does. It's, it's a lot. There it was. I'm uh, slowly but surely getting through it. Mm-hmm. Or were you able to find any laughter in it? It is a really interesting idea, right? It is. I I think because of a lot of other emotional 
things that were connected with it. No. Mm -hmm. No. Um, well, no, you know, I take it back. Gary always was able to make me laugh mm -hmm. about something. He always could could bring a smile to my face or, or whatever. So he was he really helped a lot. Yeah, I think it's often overlooked that it's that it can be something very simple that helps you really step into a place of healing because otherwise you're just sort of trapped in the, the sadness and the sorrow part. Right. But um, I know that Misty is um, you know, in a in a very rough location right now, so maybe that's part of the reason why she hasn't been able to rejoin us. I know that I'm not sure what the weather is like where she's at. She's in the Arctic, so... <laughs> oh, I, I know. When, when she shows pictures, it is crazy. She's right by the ocean, or, mm -hmm. or at this point, the Arctic ice. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Misty J says, hi. Hello. And... Nice. Pardon? She has such a sweet face. She does. She is so sweet. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the comments that, that uh, her and I have shared back and forth, she's just a sweetheart. And maybe you and I could discuss um, Jamal's question, mm -hmm. sure. which actually, when I get down to his question, um, is he asks, do you believe that anyone has come back from to life after death? That's a meaty question. It is. I believe that however people experience that, they may feel because there's a consistency there that they've come back to life, but I think it's more of an experience of your, your energy sort of leaving your body for a couple minutes and then maybe coming back. I don't know. It's hard to explain. I haven't really had an experience with that personally, so I don't know what it would feel like or be like, but... Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm usually up for anything, so I'm up for an open mind about those kinds of things. I mean, why not? If everything else is possible, why not that? Yeah, and, and that's kind of where I am, too. Um, I, I try to keep an open mind about it. Um, however... Is Misty trying to, to message you? <laughs> I keep hearing yes. a, a message. <laughs> She says, oops, lost connection, trying to get back in now. Okay. Which is wonderful. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and Blair says, the subject is difficult and humor is hard to find, with the exception of black humor. Yeah. And I'm not sure that black humor really helps. I, w I would love to get, I hope Misty can get back in, because I would love to get her perspective on that. I guess that depends if you like, if you have a more sarcastic sense of humor or not, right? Yeah. It always depends on that, but well, I mean, I didn't know if there was anything else that you wanted to to add about. Um, I think it was Jamal's comment. Yeah, I mean, we've all heard the, um, you know, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel experience. Um, you know, seeing. Um, the experience of seeing loved ones and being sent back, I've heard of that one. But I think the very inconsistency of the reports and the fact that everyone sees something different, mm -hmm. to me, kind of validates the fact that maybe their energy left their body for a brief period, but they weren't really dead. Yeah. Yet. Yeah, so it's it's interesting to think about, but I like how he turned it around and made it into like, yeah, I mean, because we have no idea of what that unknown is, you might as well live your days to the fullest. And I think it also ties back to, you know, I, I know that Misty is going to be covering this a little bit when she comes back, but, you know, when you're the person that's left behind after someone has passed, you know, it's like, how do you how do you manage that part? Because you are the person that's still that's still living, that still has to has has a journey to, to go through while you're physically here. So, you know, managing that can be a lot easier when you can have the discussions around making death a little less scary. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think that's so true. And Missy J says, yay, Misty Lynn's back. Yay. <laughs> Missy J says, I think some people have been dead and back before, and there's been research on this, and I find it very interesting. Yeah, I do too. I'm just curious because, like you said, some of the, there's similarities and differences in everyone's experience, but it is always a unique experience in some to some degree. 
which maybe is, is a way of telling us that death in itself is going to be a unique experience for each mm -hmm. of us. Yeah. Yay, Misty's back. <laughs> Yay. So you were saying something lovely and profound, but I, I can't quite remember what that was. So if you wanted to sort of uh, maybe just jump in and talk a little bit about, you know, we talked in the in our chat the other day about conversation and then the experience gap, gap between that, you know, how you communicate death and what people feel comfortable saying about death. So I don't know if you wanted to jump into that a little bit. Yeah, I'm not sure where I cut off, but I think I was saying just um, as far as bridging the gap to, mm -hmm. to having communication. Um, often, the reason there's a gap in communication is because we have our own fears about it. So first, uh, overcoming those own fears, and then when we fully believe that the communication is possible, it really opens it up for others. But if we have a little bit of fear there that, oh, they're going to resist or they're going to um, have resistance, then that, that creates it. So we, we have to put that out of our brain, go to it with 100%, this can happen, uh, I'm going to work to make it happen, I believe it's going to happen, and, and just keep putting it out there and keep the light hard around it, which is mm -hmm. it's difficult with this topic. Um, I saw that Missy made a comment that... Uh, she brings humor to death by thinking about something funny that the um, that the past person shared, or something funny that happened, and that's a that's a great thing. We all love to remember our loved ones, and when we remember those happy times, that can be a good connector to open up the topic of death when when you remember a loved one. So great comment, Missy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Here's another comment. It takes us a little bit off the humor discussion. Um, I've come close to death both by my hand and a couple of medical times. It changed my perspective on death and now it holds no fear. That's by Blair. Hi, Blair. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I've, I've heard from most people. I'm sure I, don't, I haven't heard from anyone who's, who's come close to death. Everyone I've heard that has come close to death or had a near-death experience or been declared dead and come back, when they come back, they always walk forward with absolutely no fear of death because mm -hmm. they've been there. They've tasted it. They, they've been like, well, I've been there. It's fine. It's, it's okay. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> on the, you know, walking in their lives again, it's like they, they walk with some zip in their step because mm -hmm. It's the worst. Like the biggest, one of the biggest, I think, hidden unconscious fears, maybe fear of our own death. And my challenge to everyone is to to, to look at this and embrace it, and and really, it's amazing the transformative effect it can have on your life as far as really living your life to the fullest. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any suggestions on how someone can embrace it rather than fear it? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, yeah, yeah. One of the one of the things, and this is for any fear. And uh, my my course that I I made to help people deal with this and with fears is was originally called Facing Fear When Death Is Near. So it's a fear, and mm -hmm. that's the that's what we have to deal with. It's not so much the death part; it's the fear part, and. One of the ways to get overcome fear is to ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen? And and to, to just play with that. And, and then say, well, this, this is kind of funny. Could I live with myself if that happened? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. In, in, that's a little bit of a, a brain wobble, right? But it's like... You know what? And then it might come thinking about your own demise. Well, your children, the, the people you love. Well, there's things you can do that will will put things into place that will take care of them, or mm -hmm. that that can you feel at ease. And these are things like wills and estate planning and all that stuff that many people don't really like to do. But it's um it, it feels very good. It's kind of like taxes. You you don't want to do it, but when you're done it, oh, it feels really good. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, what, yeah. do you, what do you do when you've got someone that is very important to you and you need to have those kind of conversations and they you seem stuck on getting past, 
you know, the basics, like something that you want to kind of delve in deeper with them, but they seem resistant. How do you handle that? That's a great question. Yeah. So that's, I think it, I circle back to the, your own personal resistance, because if you've tried and they showed resistance, then you have more fear around it because it's like all the, the brains start going, oh, well, if I say this, they're just going to say that. And mm -hmm. well, if I do, oh, they shut me down once. So it's really our own mind game that we need to that we need to make positive. So if we take out all the negative fear about, well, I tried once, it's not going to work, or all the negative that we can tell ourselves why it won't work, and just change that to, it is important, I want to make it work, I believe it can happen, and I'm going to keep trying. And when you change those fears around the conversation into just positive belief, and that can just be pretending. Pretending is amazing. Um, the, the power that kind of like fake it until you make it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the power of the imagination is incredible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Einstein said imagination is more powerful than knowledge. And if you pretend something happens, it's almost like it's happening. And, and science is starting to prove this. So uh, p visualize it. Get yourself into that really high vibration, high positive place. You can do the heart, the quick coherence technique. Mm -hmm. And when you think of that beauty place, you're feeling peace and love and all is well in the world. <laughs> and that's when you interject the thought and the seed of this conversation. And mm -hmm. that putting that feeling and that energetic vibe into the conversation somehow sends it out into the energy waves that, that this is possible. Now, when you're thinking of all the ways that this conversation won't happen, you're attracting the conversation won't happening, not happening. Right. So the trick is really to go to that co place of coherence and love and light feeling. And when you're in that place, that's when you drop in the seed of the hard things that you have to do in life. And, and then just visualize it playing out, feel it, feel at peace with it, and, and, and just walk in, walk in faith and trust. And any time that little fear comes in, just, oh, no, we left you behind. Yes, I like how you mentioned that, though. There is a lot of trust and faith that has to come into that whole process. You know, you have to trust that your own feelings are, are about it are okay because they're what you're feeling in the moment and you know when you're trying to have that conversation with other people you also have to trust that you show up as the best version of yourself to have the conversation so there there's a lot of faith in that being in the overall communication part of it too yeah yeah and I love that you brought up feelings because the work that I do with people is mm -hmm. really a lot about trusting and honoring your feelings and, and feelings you know, sometimes we think anger, madness, sadness are negative, and we, you know we're not allowed to feel those, and those are bad. And I'm a bad person. There's guilt and fear, but our feelings are our internal guidance system, mm -hmm. and our feelings are the the things inside that they're sensory that like tell us, okay, something's wrong here. I, you know, and and they're really a they need to be expressed and, and just, you know, no judgment on them. This is how I feel. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're with someone who loves you and you're, you're in that place of feeling peace, that it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, um, I'm openly expressing how I feel. The outcome doesn't matter. No, pra The practice of non-attachment to outcome is huge as well. Yeah. This is really... It really, it's, it's really changed my life. That's that's a huge one. So just coming into the conversation, um, ready to share what you want to share, and and just being ready to put it on the table and walk away and have no expectations about the others. And and that's that'll get it going. That's yeah, it's a lot of pressure to put on someone else to think the way you do, right? Yeah. You don't want to put them in that position where, hey, I'm not okay unless you agree with me kind of thing, especially about something like this. Yeah, and that's that's kind of a recipe for, for failure and that, that won't work. But as, as human beings, 
mean, from my perspective, if, if something's important to you, uh, we can control ourselves, we can't control others. So your job is simply to lay it on the table. This is how I feel, this is what I'd like. And, and that's really all we can do. And what the other party does with it is, you know, it's infinite the ways that people can, can take things and deal with it. We don't know. And when we um, allow the other side to do with it what they will and trust in their process, then really we've done all that we can do. All we can do is put it on the table. Mm -hmm. you know, and we can do all we can. And then we, we can feel good about it. And we like, did that. And, and they know them. Well, sometimes, I mean, it's really hard with your loved ones to go into something without expectations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially with a spouse or, or your mom, your dad, I mean, really close loved ones. Yeah. yeah. So that... Um, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, again, it comes back... Well, it's all about self-acceptance. It's mm -hmm. all about fully accepting yourself and where you're at and your feelings and everything about you. So it's about first loving yourself. And when you're in that place of full self-acceptance, which I believe is perhaps our life journey or for, for many people, mm -hmm. um, then the outcome, then you are able to come from that place of non-attachment to outcome. Mm -hmm. And it's it takes work, and you, you do have to get to that place of heart coherence and of that place of peace. And when you are coming from that place of peace, um, anything's possible. And I, and I, my attestation to this is when my mom passed, and we're dealing with my sister, mm -hmm. and my sister is, is uh, um, if there's anything, she can see a problem with it. So I was. I was really scared <laughs> to have to deal with my mom's death with my sister, and I was really afraid. And, and I just went, well, I, one thing I did that I've never done before, I went online and I looked for a protection. So I learned this little technique to make a protection bubble around myself so I knew I would be safe in case she did decide to get angry with me or something. So, mm -hmm. But beyond that, what I really did is just continue to stay in my place of heart-centered and my place of love and my place of no expectations from her. I really went in with, this is what I'd like, this is how I feel, and I just left it on the table. And it was absolutely magical what happened. I've never communicated with my sister before, but this was so big, it, uh, it really was groundbreaking. You know, it was like my mother's death led me to this because I had to. I knew otherwise it would just be, it would be hard. So, right. So, but it was a magical experience, and she did come. You know, when I laid it on the table, she. But, I, <laughs> but I, I accepted it. I was, you know, I was just there. I was what's what's called holding space for her to feel mm -hmm. and express whatever she needed to feel and express in her journey as a human experiencing her mother's death and I, I just I just I didn't push my point I'd already laid it on the table I allowed her to express and then slowly you know she just turned around or, or it just kind of dissolved or the problem faded and we, we walked away and we came back but the, the feeling of peace mm -hmm. um, stayed with me and it ended up we were we were all fine. It was very it was a very pleasant experience, as, as pleasant as, as it could be, I guess. Right. I like it where you said that um, you allowed her to express her feelings because so often, mm -hmm. at at least in my past, what has happened a lot is that my feelings have been um, pointed out as you know you know you're wrong to feel that way. You should feel this way or you should feel this way, and you know, nobody's emotions are wrong, irregardless of whether it matches how you feel. I, you know, I just don't believe that anyone's emotions are, are wrong. Mm -hmm. Which is so big around a topic like this, especially, because when you until you're going through it, you don't really know how you're going to feel. So, 
you have to be very accepting of whatever happens to come up for you. Not only just through the grieving process, but you know, I know um, the three of us also talked about, well, what do you do when you're the one that's left behind? You know, how are you dealing with that day-to-day -day life or the things that you have to move through when the person that you love is no longer here? I know that Misty had some good tips on that as well. Yeah, well, it's kind of like um, the zone unknown. Or like you're, you're living in this crazy world, just chugging along with your life, doing your thing, and then all of a sudden, it's, it's just like everything that was normal, like the 3D world just collapses. Mm -hmm. And, and it's kind of this big void in this space. And and, and I, I kind of relate it. It's like you're a baby again. You, you almost don't know how to move. You don't know how to function. You don't know how to cook for one person. You don't know how to shop for one person. Maybe maybe it was your spouse, and he always drove, and now you have to drive. Or, or There's these little things that in life, when you're a partner, your other side does, and suddenly you have to take care of it. So, so you're just like, you know, God help me, or whatever. Like, you're, what do I do? So, mm -hmm. so this big boy. Uh, it's huge, and and I I, I talked about being a baby, and, and there is this. It's like you're starting over. So this is uh, my brand is bittersweet blessing. So within every challenge, and the biggest one being death, there is a blessing within that. And, and from my perspective, that blessing is, is you get to really uh, look at your life. And, and, and deeply, and, and most people, when we're chugging along with our life, we, we often don't have time to do that really deep look inside. Who, who are we? What's important to us? Mm -hmm. What do we want to do with our lives? And when someone close to you dies, these things are, like everything else that was spinning in your brain, that's gone. That's just fluff. And then these really, these really important questions come to forefront. And, and it's kind of exciting. It's scary. It's darn scary. <laughs> but it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to really start out, out again and start out with meaning and to go to those deep places that are so rich. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know that it can be a different experience when you're losing someone that you're really close to and speak to all the time, or maybe you know you lose a person that you love very much but haven't talked to, so there's you know a little guilt associated with not having connected with them recently and that kind of stuff. Like, what advice would you give to people sort of dealing with some guilt around that? Yeah, so guilt and fear are the, the two big big things that, that I work to address with people. And guilt is, uh, again, it's a mind game. So it's um, what story are you telling yourself? Uh, because or something your mother or father told you when you were really young, or a teacher, and you, it may be unconscious, but you have this belief that something you did or said or thought is wrong, mm -hmm. and then you, know, you feel that heaviness and you, it's killed. It's, it's horrible. It's a horrible place to be. Um, it comes back to self-love and acceptance, you know, I'm okay. Forgiveness is huge. Forgiveness is huge. When I, forgiving yourself and forgiving others, and, and this is, I mean, I can say it's huge, but until you experience the, the thing of forgiveness, um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that goes right along with this comment or question from Blair who says, any thoughts on how one copes with losing a parent and not being there to say goodbye? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that that's a really good question for me because when my father died, um, I mean, we rushed out of here as soon as we knew he was passing, and he passed um, maybe 20 minutes before we got there. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually have had this huge amount of guilt wrapped around the fact that I stopped to get a cup of coffee on the way down there, and if I hadn't stopped to get that cup of coffee, maybe I may have been able to say goodbye. We always try to rationalize it, right? <laughs> it's an it's an easy thing to do to put that self blame, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So here's the thing, you're. Your father, well, I really believe people go when they feel it's the right time. And some, I've heard many stories that say that uh, 
um, you know, the families in the room, they're waiting, they're spinning almost 24-7 with the, the dying loved one. And then someone pops out for a minute and, and boom, they're gone. So, and then they kick themselves and there's all the guilt and exactly what you were saying. Um, but often the loved one feels that it's easier for the, the other loved ones not to be around. And, and I've heard this time and time again. So that's one perspective. Um, the other one is, is the, the guilt and, and, and the idea that how, well, shifting like how we can say goodbye after they're gone. And if you believe that we are energy, and Einstein said that every, you know, everything's energy, energy doesn't die, it just changes form. So our body dies, but our, the spirit of us goes on. So, you know, they say talk to your ancestors, you can pray, what, whatever you do, but the, the energy that was your father, was your parent, that was your loved one, is still in existence. We just can't see it anymore, but it's still there. So by all means, have those conversations now. Keep the communication up. We can't see them. We can't look into their eyes. We can't hug them, but we can think and and. Think. And thoughts are, you know, thoughts are things. Science mm -hmm. has proved that. So just have those conversations now. Their energy is there, and they will receive it. And and, and know this. And, and uh, yeah. So I, I I'd recommend everyone to play with this and and see how they feel after. And and I still communicate with my mom. And, and I we I laugh a lot because when when she passed on. She was really burdened the last part of her life, so it was, wasn't really my mom, but when she passed over, I was able to really connect with her youthful energy and the, the essence of what, who she was, and that's who I communicate with now, and, and that's why we have so much fun there. I, I really enjoy it when I think about her. That's a very interesting belief, and, and kind of goes right along with how I believe, too. Um, Jamil asked an interesting question. Misty Lynn, do you think that people who arrive at the point of no return and decide to commit suicide are afraid of death or not? Now, my take on this, um, being there, because you know, I had a really rough, things were really rough for me in my younger years, um, is it the pain that they're going through right now and the fear that they're in right now so overcomes the fear of death mm -hmm. that you almost, and that's my take. What do you think, uh, Misty? Mm. Yeah, I would say probably the same. You know, like the, the pain that they're going through right now, it's, it's bigger than the fear of death because if it wasn't, they wouldn't go through with it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so, so I think that was half the question. Um, did I answer that? Was there more to that? No, I think that was the question. Um, yeah, do you think they're afraid of death? And and you know the fear may still be there, but I think that they um, just you know the fear and that they're going through at this time and or at the, that time when they decide that they want to try um, just overshadows it. I think at that time they're more afraid of life. They're more afraid of life. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, there's also a really great comment here from Rain. I don't know if you can see that one. Um, yeah, I got it. I was, I was moving up toward. <laughs> yay! Well, I'll go ahead and let you post it then. <laughs> uh, are you talking about the, well, Misty, because she's got two great ones. Yeah, the first one really because it is really hard when you're trying to deal with your own emotional state, staying balanced, really finding a way to get stay grounded, and then being okay with letting someone just be emotional in the way that they need to be. You know, it's, it's like how much are you, you know, withholding, how much are you sharing, that kind of thing. is It's hard to balance, especially when you're in an emotional state as well. So, yeah, I think Rain is right on when she's saying that, that Misty did a great job with that. Oh, yeah, definitely. And then her other comment I thought was really good, too, um, where she said, um, with my dad passing in the last few months, I noticed over the year he had an illness that carried on for a little over a year mm -hmm. that some of the other people in my dad's condition that for some 
other people, my death condition wasn't about him, it was about their own feelings of fear around death. Mm -hmm. It must be very difficult for a person who knows that they're dying because so many people are afraid of death. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, this is really big. Um, so often the, the fear of death gets in the way of really being present with our loved ones when they're dying because we, we have so much resistance to it or friends or that we're just like, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do, I don't want to deal with this. And the, the resistance just comes up and, and we miss out on this great, amazing part of life that's called death. And hospice workers are, are really good for this. And I, I made a little ebook. And it's like what to say and do when when a loved one's dying. But it's it's all about being heart centered. And all the best thing you can do for anyone, really, at any time in life, <laughs> dying or not, but especially dying, is to be uh, is to be present. Mm -hmm. To be present with with a heart centered presence. And you don't need to do anything. It's funny because I was going to start out the book. Well, you don't need to do and say anything. <laughs> <Not predictable. laughs> but it's true. Like, all you need to do is simply be present, feel okay with yourself and with the situation, and that in itself is a huge gift. Like mm -hmm. just to be there and allow yourself to be with each other and breathe with each other and know what's coming and be okay with that is really the best gift we can give. Yeah, because people could put a lot of pressure on themselves to say the quote-unquote right thing. Uh, there really isn't a right thing that you can say to someone who's grieving. It's it's their own process. It's just that presence is really what is the most helpful for them. They just know that you're there or thinking of them, and that may be the best that you can do, and that's perfectly what they need. Oh, exactly. One of the things that, that actually sent me into anger was when people would come up to me with the regular platitudes. <laughs> You know, the, the things everybody says, and I just wanted to go, just go away and leave me alone because you're not being real. You're not, mm -hmm. you know, and you're not going to allow me to be real. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, that's actually, that's what got me into this thing with death and into following this call, and, and it wasn't like, oh, yeah, that's cool, I'm going to do that. It, it was hard for me to make this but um, when my my mom passed, the huge depth of feeling I was experiencing, beside these platitudes, there's about five common phrases or maybe less, like "I'm sorry for your loss." I don't know these basic phrases that people say, and I was like, "That's crazy." There's just a huge gap. Like it, it's it's just stupid that you know the the language abilities, the conversation and discussion abilities we have as humans around this topic that is so deeply human. It's so it's such a rich, vast area to explore. Like if I could ex sit down and express with someone how I was feeling during that time, if I had a warm body who was open to re like, wow, we could have talked for. Weeks, like it's just, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I love what you say about that, and that's that's kind of what I'm about is is having the conversations and, and making it more normal to talk about. So. Well, that's awesome, Missy, or Missy, sorry. And we're almost out of time. Actually, we're way over time. <laughs> So, um, Misty, do you want to tell everyone how they can find you, about your new project that you have going on, your HOAs, I mean, give us a quick rundown on everything you're doing. Yeah, yeah sure. So I'm at bittersweetblessing.com, um, and you can find out more about me there. I am in the process of, of la launching a course. It's the first thing. I'm kind of new to this online world, so it's, it's all a learning journey. Um, uh, my course is called the Peace Process, and I just came up with this acronym. I probably can't remember it, but I know the P is presence, the E is evoking courage, the A is allowing feelings, C is creating comfort, and E is embodying the new you. So nice. it's a process, and it's, <laughs> it's I'm surprised I remember it. It's basically a download of all that I know and, and some of what I've touched on here. So. So I'm going to be launching that soon, and in my next, uh, my fear I have to get over is to create a webinar that tells people about it. So um, 
stay tuned. There, there should be some information on my website, or if you're interested, you can email me. And, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, thank you for for discussing it with us and um, helping us learn how to discuss death with others. I, I think it's it's a very very important subject. Yeah, just letting reminding people that it's okay to be themselves. That it may be a situation that's happening that's uncomfortable, but there isn't any reason to not be natural and be yourself. And that's really great too. So thank you for reinforcing that. Exactly. I'll bring that now. <laughs> and Katrina, you want to tell you want to tell everyone about you a little bit and where they can find you? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Katrina, um, otherwise known as Creative Katrina. I'm the plus here. You can find me at creativekatrina.com, and I really love to help people shift their mindset and perspective, especially when it comes to their own creativity. So I do that through the twice-weekly blog posts that I write and also through some creativity coaching and really helping people with their content development so they can find their true voice online. So that's that's kind of how all that package comes together, and I'm, I'm really excited to be able to co-host this show with you, Arizona. It's a great opportunity, and I'm, I'm excited about it. It's, it's really fun. Well, I'm I'm really excited about having you on as a co-host. I think we we have a good chemistry between us, and we bounce mm -hmm. well. And which that's you know it's hard to find sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and I'm Arizona Lowe. You can find me at todaysvisions.com, um, and which is a sponsor of the show. And if you would like to guest on um, the show, just give me a holler and we'll check it out and discuss it. So I think that's it for today. We'll talk to you all later. Bye. Have a great weekend. <laughs>